Hey, Whiskey Ringers, welcome to a brand new intro. First off, there are still a few bottles of our barrel single barrel rye finished in Armagnac casks, picked in partnership with This Is My Bourbon podcast. Check out the show notes for links to purchase. Second, I am thrilled to announce that I've joined the Bar Cart Co op. This group of podcasts and shows has a show or multiple for everyone. I'll talk more about them in the mid roll. Finally, there are still two $25 spots available on Patreon. These are the last two spots that will ever be opened on that tier, so if you've been putting it off, grab your spot today. There are also spots available at the $15 a month level if you want to support, but can't quite commit to that $25 tier just yet. There's a spot in supporting for everyone's budget, and I truly thank you all for making this podcast possible. Hey folks, welcome to a new episode of the Whiskering Podcast. Today, I'm thrilled to bring on Brian Smith, the master distiller of Hard Truth Distilling in Nashville, Indiana. Brian, welcome on. Hi, David. Thanks for having me. So jumping right in, uh, just to mention it's Nashville, Indiana, not Nashville, Tennessee. If you put the wrong one into the GPS, it's going to take you a little bit off course, but hopefully you probably still hit some good distilleries along the way. But, so Hard Truth, let's start right from the beginning. Hard Truths founded in 2015 in Nashville, Indiana, about an hour and a half ish from both Lawrenceburg, Indiana and Louisville, Kentucky, obviously two epicenters of, of whiskey production. Uh, oh, yeah. So let's just go back to what was the, the founding idea behind Hard Truth? Sure. Yeah. So the, the, the original founders uh, founding partner group um, were some friends that uh, had started, you know, a, a, a couple businesses just out of the the love of getting together with with people and making delicious things. So, um, you know, the original uh, business that that this partner group started was Quaffon Brewing Company in uh, here in Nashville, Indiana, uh, which is, I believe, the third largest craft brewer in the state of Indiana, second or third. Um, and so they had a, a brew pub in Nashville, and they. Um, then the, the restaurants are doing well. So they, they kind of sprouted off a couple other uh, restaurant tasting rooms for the beer in Bloomington and um, another one in Nashville. And so uh, around 2014 was when um, the law was changed in Indiana to, you know, if you had a, a brewery or winery in good standing, you could co-locate a artisan distillery. And with that particular permit you were able to sell directly to the consumer um, which was interesting and unique um, so they being the entrepreneurs that they are uh, they jumped through those hoops and and got their registrations and, and bought a, a couple small stills and uh, kind of got going and that's that's where my story um, starts because I I had got to know those guys at this time through the brewery and uh, saw that there was an opportunity to to really jump into this this distillery project and and um, do something with it. So yeah, the, if you've ever any of your folks have ever been to Nashville, Indiana, we've got a a pizza restaurant right on the main drag of Van Buren um, called Big Woods Pizza. And so above Big Woods Pizza, there's a room there that used to be the the original brewery. Um, and then once they outgrew that space, moved the brewery to a bigger space that left that, you know, some of the equipment and some of the, the piping and the, the general stuff there um, available for this distillery project. So everything started in a little like 900 square foot room uh, with a couple of pot stills and, and some, uh, you know, entrepreneurs and, and uh, big ideas. And just to touch on that, the 2014 artisan distillers law, uh, to your knowledge, what kind of, what was the impetus for that? Cause I can't imagine MGP was asking for that. So. No, that was, it was Ted Huber and um, Ed Clare, who is the state rep down there. So I know, you know, there's a, um, one of Ted's main distiller winemaker guys, um, Jason Heilgenberg is a, a great friend of mine from college. So, um, you know, I was, I kept up with him and I learned what they were doing. They were making some pork, port wine fortifying with some brandy out of Michigan and they wanted to be able to make their own brandy. So Ted worked with uh, Ed Clare to get this, this thing written and passed. And uh, that was how that got started. So I think the first few, um, the first few permits that were issued were Cardinal spirits, uh, dusty barn distillery 
and Hard Truth, and of course, Starlight. Right, right. We're of the original partners. I mean, you said it started a, a brewery, a brew pub, a restaurant. It, had any of them come with whiskey making experience, though, or distilling experience? You know, I, I know that Jeff, one of my partners, he's he's got a history. You know, he's got family in his history from Ireland who have some pretty robust whiskey making experience. Um, Ed Ryan, one of the partners, is a chemistry. You know, has a chemistry degree from Indiana University. Um, so you know, and then I I come from a history of um, you know growing up in Southern Indiana. My dad and his friends we made wine once a year made sausage all the time i brewed a lot of beer in college Um, i ended up finding out later that both my maternal grandfather and my uh my my maternal great-grandfather and my my paternal great-grandfather both were illicit whiskey makers um so there's definitely some there's some threads coming through there but you know oftentimes there's a story of someone you know worked for maker's mark for 15 years and and left to start a distillery project so that is not our story um we really you know which which i i would say has been an advantage for us overall because we aren't we haven't been stuck to any kind of paradigm of the way things have to be or should be um we've we've blazed our own path which you know is is i think a lot of the reason why we ended up as a sweet mash distillery and uh, you know, we weren't ever trying to be disruptors or, you know, do things different for the sake of being different. Uh, But we also weren't locked into any kind of uh, historical or familial traditions that, that couldn't be uh, broken. Gotcha. Gotcha. So uh, to jump into Indiana a bit, I mean, there is a big elephant in the room with Indiana and it's come up with, other guests, uh, you know, Alan Bishop's been on twice uh, from Spares French Lick, and I love Alan. Yeah, it's fantastic. If you ever want, if if you ever want to have a podcast of me and Alan uh, duking it out about whether sweet mash or sour mash is better, let me know. He and I always joke about that. So <laughs> I would definitely do that because I I <laughs> have many questions. Um, sure, I've had I've for what it's worth, I've had I have a question later about this, but I've had um, Doctor Pat on too to talk about sweet mash and and everything oh, yeah. doing wilderness trail so it's come up before but i think a, a head-to-head on that would be fantastic well as uh, long as we can be in in like the lucador uh costumes with the masks and and give us a ring so we can actually physically wrestle i think if, if that you make that happen i'm in done <laughs> so uh you know the elephant in the room obviously is that if in the larger whiskey milieu if you will when Indiana and whiskey are in the same sentence, it usually means someone else. Sure. Uh, and people like like you, like Ted, like um, Alan are are trying to change that so that when you see distilled in Indiana on the back of a bottle, you know you know that it's not MGP or and you know, nothing against or wrong with MGP is just because they're so big they take a lot of a lot of the minds uh let's try that again because they're so big they take up a lot of the mind space for people sure so for for um hard truth i'm curious you said that you weren't trying to be disruptors uh mm-hmm. necessarily but in the same vein though was there a thought both in the founding um and as things were ramping up to how you're going to differentiate yourself as an Indian sure. whiskey that wasn't NGP. Sure. Well, so think about, you know, if I, a c- couple things, first of all, you know, it's, it's interesting. I have, when I have these discussions like this, especially involving MGP, um, you know, really the lens of the way that I look at the industry and the way that I look at whiskey making and what's happening and how we're positioning ourselves um, you know, my lens and, and our lens, uh, you know, as the ownership group is that, you know, we aren't, we aren't looking at it from, uh, obviously we're considering the consumer, but we aren't looking at it from an enthusiast's standpoint. So, you know, I think, uh, whiskey enthusiasts or people that are in the industry from, you know, drinking or enjoying or talking about or being in clubs or bourbon clubs, I think their perception of, you know, 
how large MGP looms or, or what they mean to the industry is maybe a little bit different than ours. Um, that there are than mine. I'll speak for myself than mine. And then secondly, if you think about from when we started in 2015 till now, um, there's been a gigantic difference in the significance of MGP in the consumer mindset. So I remember really clearly in 2015, the talk was a little bit more kind of hush hush, like, you know, this is really made in Indiana. Um, and it was the discovery of that, you know, happened kind of in a time horizon from 2015 till I'd say about 2020. And then by that time, kind of everybody, you know, cat was out of the bag. And not only that, but it was being embraced. I mean, people were talking about, you know, people were celebrating, oh, this is, this is some seven-year-old MGP, 21% bourbon mash bill. And they meant it in a positive way, not like, oh, this is some 21% MGP. You know, see what I'm saying? So uh, that's what I noticed. I observed there to be a change in the consumer's mentality from a, this quote unquote dirty little secret that no one was talking about to being something that, that people were talking about that, you know what, it's pretty, pretty good whiskey. Um, it's just, let's all acknowledge that. Okay. Yeah. There's, there are a ton of new brands hitting the shelves. Um, these aren't distilleries. These are brands, right. And they they might be doing their own finishing or blending or, or whatever to create their own unique fingerprint. And I think, think some people have done that very, very well. Um, but there wasn't this hiding of the fact that it was MGP. So I think the consumer awareness um, and the enthusiast awareness and, and their education on it, um, it, it's interesting. It, it really, I, I think what it speaks to is, is, is it is, it is good whiskey. It'd be, it'd be one thing if it were really bad whiskey and people were trying to kind of make something good out of it, but it's, it's really good whiskey. I mean, um, the, the fun thing about making whiskey and finding your position in the Indiana market from our perspective is, you know, I can make the same mash bill. I could have the identical still. I could figure out every single thing that they're doing in MGP. Our whiskey's still not going to taste like theirs. You know, there's, there's a unique DNA thumbprint of what hard truth whiskey tastes like uh, that I can affect and our crew and our distillers can affect to some degree. But at the same time, there's, that's a beautiful thing about whiskey making, right? There's a, there's an alchemic property of this that's in the, in the unknown um, that kind of makes it so much fun. And I think that was the biggest thrill for me as a distiller is, you know, once our whiskey started to reach the three, four, five year range, is to notice that across all of our mash bills, there is some flavor through lines, right? There is a, a DNA, a strand that carries across all of hard truth, sweet mash whiskeys um, that's truly unique to us. And so, and I would say, you know, I've, I've tried a lot of, drank a lot of Allen's whiskeys. I would say the same thing for Allen. I would say the same thing for Ted and, and, um, and Jason and the crew at Starlight. So, you know, I, I guess I don't, I don't think about them in a way of like, oh, I've got to break free of the, of, of people's perception of MGP um, as much as I know once I get, you know, our liquid to, to people's lips and tell the story, they're not going to be confused. You know what I mean? It's, it's a, we have a very different uh, flavor differentiation and I love that. And I still, there are, there are a lot of MGP whiskeys that I think are tremendous. So, um, so I, there's room for everyone. And, you know, one time I talked with Bill Samuels Jr. And, and uh, you know, he gave me the, you know, the rising tides float, you know, float all boats speech. Um, and, you know, his, his perception was there's plenty of market for all of us. And the more that I can help you make better whiskey, uh, the better it is for the whole industry. So that's kind of how I feel about it. I mean, you know, um, I, I, I view that there, there's a lot of growth potential still left in Indy in the state of Indiana. Tremendous amount. And and I'm just so excited. Every time I hear a new distillery is popping up in Indiana, I'm like, this is awesome, right? Because now we're we're really solidifying ourselves as, you know, everybody knows Kentucky bourbon and Tennessee whiskey. Well now we've got Indiana in the mix with our Indiana Rye Act and with the quality of the liquid that's coming out of Indiana. It's uh it's we've got a lot of green grass ahead of us for sure. Awesome. 
but you already answered my next question, which was, you know, what is the selling point to say, hey, we're not, yeah. we're making Indiana whiskey, we're making hard truth whiskey, not. Yeah. MGP. So, um, well, that- so, yeah, for us, for us, it really is. It's in the sweet mash story. Um, uh, and, and then the, the locality, I mean, you know, we're, we're in, we're in Brown County, Indiana, our climate, our, our, you know, the grains that we get from our farmers, which are just right down the road, um, the water source, everything really gives us, you know, um, a, a place in the, in the world of whiskey. And let's jump back for a sec also to the, that Indiana ride designation. Uh, so we've seen a couple of states, uh, my home state included, do like Empire Rye, Missouri whiskey, in addition to the uh, existing like Tennessee whiskey regulations. Uh, what is the Indiana ride designation? And how did that come about? Sure. So when we were laying down our whiskeys, you know, so we started laying down bourbon and rye whiskey at the same time. But as you and probably most of your listeners understand. Rye tends to um, it, it tends to become more delicious and drinkable earlier, right? So you know, a well distilled and well you know good barreled rye whiskey um, can be s- just tremendous at three years old. Um, so we knew that really we were going to be launching our ryes before we were launching our bourbons, and then as we went through the history of you know exactly how many brands have built their name on the backs of MGP's 95.5 rye and how much of that whiskey has been made over the past, you know, a couple decades. Um, and then the fact that we were really, you know, we were tasting through our sweet mash ryes and we were like, whoa, we've got something really unique and special here. Um, we, we thought, well, that's, that's a no brainer, really. You know, it's, it's a story because, you know, no one's going to give you that designation. You have to, you kind of have to let the world know. So we took it upon ourselves and the, the, the founders here at hard truth um, worked with our local legislature, uh, local legislators um, to, and I think Ed, Ed ultimately pinned the Indiana Rye Act. And, and we were very careful that we didn't want to make it, um, we didn't want to carve it out to fit hard truth. We really wanted to make it inclusive of, of, of all of our Indiana producers. So we didn't make it controversial. We didn't try to deviate from the federal designation for what is rye whiskey. So essentially we just layered on, you know, if you want to put the words Indiana rye whiskey on a label, it had to be mash from a distilled age for a minimum of two years in the state of indiana um because rye grain isn't readily grown all that much in indiana um we didn't add in there kind of like the empire rye we didn't add in that the grains needed to be grown in indiana um now eventually maybe that's something that that we look at you know if we can start to get some of our farmers to grow some rye because actually there are there are a couple of of varieties that grow really really well in indiana so Dwayne kulenschmidt who um, grew the rye that's in our harvest rye, who also owns Dusty Barn Distillery. He's down in southern Indiana in near Mount Ver- in the Mount Vernon area, and he grows tremendous rye down there. So it is possible to grow great rye in the state of Indiana. But so the Indiana Rye Act was really just to just to let the world know, you know, uh, we're creating a designation to celebrate the the you know the historical precedent of really great rye whiskey being made in the state of indiana and you know we talked to all of our fellow distillers we talked to, to the people at mgp or ross and squib we talked to alan we talked to ted we talked to the cardinal and everyone was in agreement and we talked to uh, bill welter at journeyman let him know what we were doing because you know we knew he was he was heading to indiana um and uh, everyone was on board so it really it passed with very little you know really no um, no one opposed to it uh, because it's it's just a designation that really helps all of us and and also it you know it, inv- it invites the state of Indiana to participate in the marketing and um, promotions of Indiana tourism and great Indiana product. Yeah. It, it was uh, I, I guess surprising to hear that there's that there isn't a lot of rye grown in Indiana. I mean, on one hand, it's not surprising because it's rye is not usually the the cash crop it's usually corn or wheat maybe soy right um but so on that side it's not particularly surprising but at the same time 
rye grows nearly anywhere that isn't tropical. And I'm sure there's a strain that grows in the tropics too, but basically if you're temperate or colder, it'll grow. Uh, And also because rye has been so synonymous with Indiana whiskey, uh, at least over the past few decades, if not further. So when you're looking at um, the current amount of rye that's being grown, you're trying to find local distill, oh, sorry, you're trying to find local farmers who are growing the rye. Um, you know, what, what strains do work best for the area and for hard truth? Well, I wish I was a grain expert to give you the exact strain, but I can, what I can tell you is, is that, you know, you are correct about rye growing anywhere. Rye, there is actually a tremendous amount of rye that is grown in Indiana. It's just grown as a cover crop instead of a cereal crop. So right. the genetics that they use don't really ever go to any kind of cereal seed. They just use it to, you know, put nitrogen back in the soil uh, in the off season. They'll grow it and then they either till it under or, or at least the roots to, to fertilize, you know, corns or bean, you know, corn or beans, whatever they're planting the next year. Um, but I, I know because I, I know Dr. Pat real well, and 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 I, I remember recall him kind of saying the same thing that they they had a farmer that had found some good strains down in Kentucky that they were growing, and actually I would love to tell you that I was the mastermind of of uh, of the the rye that we get from Southern Indiana, but that that came to me from from Dr. Kulenschmidt. He he called me and said, "Hey, we were we decided to plant some extra rye this year, and and it just." really did well and we've got this really high quality you know um and i've got truckloads of it and would you be interested and i said well let's let's try a batch and see how the distillate tastes and go from there and and it was delicious and so um you know that's really i know we're kind of jumping around but that's that was what the harvest ride initially that's why that was was laid down was because i i wanted to, to come up with a product that was highlighting Indiana farmers. So I, I don't know the strain. It's not something I'm hiding. I could certainly probably find out. Dwayne, Dwayne could tell you right off the top of his head, I'm sure. But uh, he's a, he's an interesting guy. He's he's super funny, super smart guy. He's actually a an, an anesthesiologist um, in the Evansville area and has been for years and uh, has a, a little farm distillery out of his barn. And it's just great. I love Dwayne. I love what he's doing. And he was one of the first licenses in the state of Indiana. So it's, it's a good story. Awesome. We'll have to reach out to him too and hopefully have him on. Uh, yeah. So when Hard Truth started, you were working off and I think this is either a quote from you or from, uh, from Tom, but a rudimentary pot still was the first oh yeah that's, still you that's kind that's a that's a kind way to talk about those stills <laughs> yeah. uh you've obviously come a long way now you've got a you know 14 inch diameter column still continuous column i should say a 250 gallon pot still with a vodka column on it um do you you know do you still have that original pot still do you ever use it we do and it actually you know i'd say that that probably like most things in life um if you if you start out with some very simple um, equipment or procedures and have to work really really hard to get something good to happen from those, I think it makes you better overall. So you know, I, I always joke about those stills, but they are. I mean, they work great. I mean, we we got them finally. It wasn't like it was the stills' fault. It was just that they weren't they weren't quite as intuitive as. Uh, as we thought they would be and so it took took a while to really figure them out from a personality standpoint but you know once we got them figured out we were making great spirit off of them Um, but the way that our system worked with um, just the way that the the pot still was and also our grain handling system with the original system i wasn't able to ferment or distill anything on the grain so, uh, you know, it was more like a beer system because it really was. It started out as Quathon's brew system. So we were essentially doing a lottering technique, which is what you do for like single malt scotches, um, where you you cook the grain and then you t- actually take the liquid off of the grain matter itself. And then you ferment that liquid matter um, and then put that in the pot still. So our first, our first, you know, year and a half of operations 
um, we had to operate that way. That's why we really don't have any bourbon or rye whiskey um, from that time period because I just simply couldn't make it. Um, so that's we we figured out how to make a really great weeded vodka um, and then a gin from our weeded vodka and then a tremendous rum that I'm still very proud of to this day um, that we could all accomplish on those stills. So yes, we do still have the stills. I uh, I talk to people about them whenever I can. They're 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 funny. They're they're a, they're a great part of the story. Yeah. Now, I think you just answered this question too, but uh, do you have yeah. any of the, do you have any spirit from those original runs? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We've got a library of, you know, we, we're, we, we've got, I've definitely got a library of, of spirits from that. And, and uh, I'll tell you, we, we got it. I mean, it wasn't like that spirit was terrible. We would never release anything that we, we weren't proud of. Um, but it just, it, to give you an idea, it would take, what did we, we figured it out one time. I think it was to make one, to fill one fifty three gallon barrel of rum. I think it took us four weeks worth of production. Wow. Um, and you know, then, and now we're filling, you know, 24 barrels every 24 hours. So it's, uh, it's, you know, we're, we're still the, 24 barrels and 20, you know, the 8,000 barrel a year rate is, is still small relative to the, to the, the giants in the industry. Um, but it sure is leaps and bounds from where we started. Yeah. And again, this is the last mention of MGP we'll make in years. It's just like it, when you compare it to, okay. you know, the giants that are nearby you. Yeah, of mm-hmm. course, it's never going to be, it's never going to be a fair comparison, but I mean, as far yeah. as a craft side distillery, or craft size and side distillery goes. I mean, basically a barrel an hour is right. Pretty damn good for it for is. Us. Yeah, it really is. And I, you know, when we were when we were talking through what we wanted to be when we grew up, um, and I did a lot of research, and and you know, I'm sure we'll talk about it later in the conversation. But I, you know, my my connections to Dr. Pat and Shane um, were very significant in our growth trajectory. Um, but as we were picking out what our, what our next equipment was going to be, what I found with this 14 inch still, um, is, is it, it had a little more flexibility and fine tune abilities, um, more similar to a pot still. Um, not that you can't fine tune the bigger columns, but you know, you're pushing through so much mash per minute in those bigger columns that, that, you know, um, it's there are ways that you can affect the flavor with the vapor temps coming off but with the 14 inch i really i really like the 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 way that i could really affect flavor with subtle changes in it um and so and and also the body of the whiskey cuz that's that's the one thing you know there used to be this um this this notion that column still whiskey was thin on the palate um and i found that you know when i went to um Dr. Pat and Shane's, you know, they had the eight, they started with the, that 18 inch column. Um, their whiskey was not thin at all. Um, and so I, you know, I, I learned from a biochemical standpoint why that was. And um, so when we, when we landed on the 14 inch column, it really was a function of, you know, we, we want to make enough whiskey to, to be able to supply, you know, to have a national footprint. Um, but we want to be able to make, uh, a, you know, really make, subtle changes to, to, to affect the flavor profile and the quality of whiskey. So I gotta, I have to ask uh, a little deeper on that one because for, for me, I've been, I've been told this and I've noticed in my own reviews and tasting notes that mm-hmm. mouthfeel is the number one determinant of whether I'm going to like something or not. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it can't be thin. It's gotta be substantial. And right. um, what I've also found my own generalization is that American whiskey, particularly corn, but not necessarily, is thinner mouthfeel than the equivalent proof of let's say a malt uh, whiskey uh, from Scotland, mm-hmm. Ireland, uh, or even an American single malt. There, there's something about the grain difference to me that mm-hmm. that creates that. But you said that when you were talking with uh, Dr. Pat and, and Shane that you found out the biochemical reason mm-hmm. why that mouthfeel is different. And I just want to see if you could uh, expound on that. So I, I'm I'm not going to pretend that I've got a chemistry degree, so I'm not going to try to use real super fancy words. But um, in in simple terms that my brain can understand, 
there are oils that are brought over um, the oils that are created during, you know, the cooking and the fermentation process from various grains. Um, and those oils can pass through distillation. Um, and so I think that the, the viscous mouthfeel that you get, some of it can come from the barrel impact as well. So um, a toasted barrel seems to to help with that, that mouthfeel, that more viscous mouthfeel. The longer, the more viscous the, the fluid is, or the more, I call it oily, the the whiskey is the longer it hangs out on your tongue plays around on those on those uh, flavor receptors so you know i think that when you're so i think about like a an ethanol column um to make fuel ethanol you know they're stripping away everything but the ethanol right Mm -hmm. um so with 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 pot still distillation if you're going to take that spirit off of the still at let's say 120 proof versus taking it off the still at 160 proof. Both can still legally be called bourbon or whiskey or whatever your big grain bill. Um, Cause you have to, you know, you have to come off the still lower than 160, but, um, but the lower in proof you take it off of your final still, the more of those congeners and, and uh, heavier alcohols and oily compounds you're going to, bring over with you in, in with the ethanol. Um, so the more you leave in, the more it's going to contribute to mouthfeel. Um, the risk you run though is depending on the quality of the grains that you're using, the quality of your fermentations, um, and the quality of your distillation, not all of those things are always good flavors. Okay. There's a lot of flavor, but they're not always good flavors. So that's where your balance is, is you know, it, it if you if you want to make just a clean thin whiskey or a light whiskey as it were um it's pretty easy to do that pretty consistently right because you're stripping away all the the variables that could potentially have bad flavors but if you're very careful with your fermentation and if you've got your still tuned so more specifically we've got the column the stripping column so the mash comes in and falls down right and and we we're keeping a very specific vapor temp at the bottom and the top of that column. I'm sorry, a temperature at the bottom and a vapor temp at the top of the column. So as that spirit comes off the first column, you know, we're looking at real time, what is that temperature? And we can make adjustments with the steam and with the cooling water to make that temperature, that vapor temperature go up or go down. The lower that vapor vapor temperature is, the more extra things we're bringing over. The higher it is, the less we're bringing over. So for certain mash bills, I have different vapor temp sets um, to to bring over what we want to bring over. Then that gets condensed and falls into the doubler, which is essentially a little pot still, and it gets reboiled. So in that pot still, you know, if you have an onion on top, you get a little extra rectification. And then the the the, the vapor temp coming off of that doubler or that little second pot still um, really is the final determination of, of how many other compounds you're bringing over with your ethanol. Okay. So, you know, if you, I've been to wild Turkey and they talk about that their, their exit proof on the still is like 122, 125, something like that, which gives them, you know, I remember the tour guide saying that bold flavor. Um, so, you know, they come off at a very, very low proof. Um, we, we typically are between 135 and 140, which is kind of right down the middle, uh, from what I've heard, um, as far as vapor temps, uh, that, I'm sorry, that's proof, not vapor temp, um, the proof that we're pulling it off of the still. Um, uh, so I, really to go back to answer your question, the, the way that you add to mouthfeel from a distillation standpoint is to lower the proof. You just got to make sure you're bringing over tasty things. Um, you don't want that. and so it's funny you talked about single malts for for whatever reason i have a very very low threshold for i call it a, a, a petrol kind of compound um that's very for me very present in single malt whiskeys i mean even some of the best ones and, and i'm super sensitive to it so it's for me it's not pleasurable um i can still enjoy a lot of different single malts but but that's that's a compound that if i were to taste that in our distillate I would adjust that temperature to not bring that over. That makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And as you've 
grown from the from that initial uh to call it the rudimentary pot still the first system to moving over to um, the column and, and the system that you've got now. How did you lock onto your first flavor profile that you wanted to create? And then the second part being, did your flavor profile change once you moved to the new equipment? Both great questions. So first of all, we weren't making whiskey in the first still. So that was, that's true. Yeah, that was easy. True. So we just got to we got to kind of start fresh with that one. So with that one, you know, and I I drove Dr. Pat crazy because I would just call him constantly as I was as we were nearing, you know, the time to really fire up that still. I I just peppered him with so many questions, and God love him. He and Shane both were were just tremendous mentors for me, and answered every single question. And finally, at one point, I'll never forget. Dr. Pat said, "Hey, Brian." now just chill out man you you've got this you've got the right equipment you've got the right process you've got great grains great yeast it's just whiskey don't overcomplicate it right so that's easy to say coming from him because he's already got all that information you know locked in but uh but so with the whiskey was a little bit easier because we got to start making whiskey on that column and through really pretty minor adjustments got to our final um flavor profile which really a, a lot of the things that we did were were discovering the, the what made the the most positive impact now you know five years later because um some of those compounds that you bring over you know change in the barrel you know at year four or year five so i'm i'm starting to to find some of these you know positive contributions that based on our procedures um i'm starting to find them now um, which is, is super exciting. I mean, that's that's what gets me fired up about this whole process. But um, back to your original question. So for our vodka and our gin, um, it was a process because our first still, it made vodka really, really, really well. It just made it very slowly. So, um, but with vodka, kind of back to my talking about proof points that you're taking it off the still and temperatures, vapor temperatures, with vodka, you know, it, it, it has to come off the still above 190 proof. So when you're taking it off the still at 190 proof, um, whether it's still A, still B, or still C, if, you're, if your grain source is the same and your fermentation techniques are the same, um, you're going to end up with a very similar product unless there's um, something just providing an off flavor. So you know, our, all of our vodka and our rums run through our pot still and our and or our vodka column. Um, and so those are those are pretty straightforward. And so so basically it was a little bit more translatable from the smaller pot still to the bigger pot still. I was able to 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 replicate that pretty quickly. Um the one thing that I well, first of all, I love our gin and the people who love our gin, it's very popular. Um, but because of our first system. I didn't have the ability to utilize a vapor basket um, to put the botanicals in. So our, our gin, we use a London dry method where you, you let the botanicals macerate in the, in the spirit for a number of days. <clears throat> then you take it out. Then you run that spirit through the pot still clean, right? So there's no, no solids in there. Um, I think if we had our system that we have now, our gin probably would be considerably different because we now have a vapor basket on our pot still to where if I wanted to infuse with botanicals in there, I could. So I did do a couple trial runs at first to see, you know, could I change from this London dry method to the vapor bas- basket method and keep the same flavor profile? And the answer on that is 100% no. Um, it was a delicious gin, but it was way different, you know, way, way different. So. I uh, mean, you know, that makes sense too. And the, uh, we've spoken to a couple of uh, gin distilleries on, on the podcast where they've tried what you said, where you have, they don't have a vapor basket or they don't have another apparatus. So everything goes in from the base. There are also ones where, right. um, and these are all ones that can use London dry, where there are other ones that put like the, you know, the roots and the seeds, the hard botanicals mm-hmm. in the liquid, let it macerate and have the lighter, more floral, the herbs and the light herbs yeah. in the basket. Right. Uh, for later on. And all these can make a London dry style and, and can all make a very good gin. But you're right that, you know, once you have a, if you've got a flavor profile that you like, 
and that other people, especially in your industry, I mean, if the consumer likes it is the most important thing too. Uh, and the consumer sure. likes it, then, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, I guess. That's right. Well, we did toy around with making, just making another gin expression. So, you know, make a, make a completely different gin to, to put out in the market. Um, but, you know, once, you know, to be perfectly honest with you, it's like, like a lot of, you know, some distilleries start with, you know, someone that came from wherever, you know, Maker's Mark, and they've got a real dedicated plan on, you know, these are our three products. This is who we're going to be from day one through day, you know, 365. This is, this is what we're going to make. Um, and some of those folks start with sourced liquid and then slowly, you know, slowly move it to their own liquid over time. Um, some folks start with, um, non-aged spirits to help fund the aged spirits that, were, that they're laying down, which is the path that we took, um, which does start to become, you know, a little bit of a challenge, uh, which I love challenges, which is, you know, what are you known for? Are you a, are you a gin and vodka distillery that, that now is making whiskey and you want the consumer to think of you as a whiskey distillery? Or are you a whiskey distillery that started making gin and vodka to keep funding, you know, your, your laying down of whiskey, which that's what we are. You know, we really, you know, if you, if you, if you drive onto this campus, you come into our beautiful 325 acres and the look and feel and everything that you, that you experience here, you know, we are a sweet mash whiskey distillery. Um, we also have a tremendous line of, uh, you know, non-whiskey spirits that, that happen to sell very, very well. Um, and so it, it's kind of a, a little bit of a, of a hybrid, hybrid, uh, brand, I guess. The Bar Cart Co-op is a group of five shows with something for everyone. First up is My Whiskey Den, hosted by Mike Lisak, Pat Bologna, and Mitch Weddle. Listen and watch live on Mondays at nine for thoughts and discussions on craft spirits and once in a while, some downright odd things. And yes, I'm talking about the cantaloupe liqueur that I can't believe could be good yet i gotta admit it's fantastic next up is bourbon turntable hosted by kevin rose and drew crawley kevin and drew are true lovers of both music and bourbon and i got to join them to talk about my own whiskey and music journey back in march it's still one of my favorite episodes i've ever been a part of and it's a show that i listen to every single week the next two are from a guy you may have heard of after all he's a two-time guest on the whiskey ring podcast Mr. Alan Bishop, head alchemist at Spirits of French Lick and self-proclaimed reviver of the history of Indiana's Black Forest. Alan has two shows in the co-op, both of which are also weekly listens for me. The first one is Distiller's Talk with co-host Christy Atkinson. It's probably the nerdiest spirits podcast I know of, and that's including my own, and I absolutely love it. Some weeks we'll be talking capturing wild yeast and long-gone ghost distilleries in the Black Forest region, Others, you'll be hearing from some of the most exciting up-and-comers in the distilling, brewing, and overall spirits-producing industry. Most of these distillers he's gone, I've never even heard of them before the episode. But after listening, all I want to do is find out more and explore new ways of looking at spirits and all the nerdy stuff that I love about this industry. And last but certainly not least is Alan's other podcast, If You Have Ghosts, You Have Everything. Exploring the paranormal side of Hoosier-occupied Kentucky Alan intertwines his own experiences with stories about neighbors, colleagues, and local legends, and why you should never go into the forest alone at night. Part scary story, part homage to the rich history of Southern Indiana, this show comes straight from Alan's heart and soul. Take a listen or watch to any of these amazing shows, and thank you to the Bar Car Co-op community for welcoming me. Join the community on Facebook, follow on Instagram and YouTube, and you'll have another show for every day of the week. This month's Impact Spotlight is on Nicknean. Founded by Annabelle Thomas, Nicknean has a pioneering approach to spirit making, putting innovation and sustainability at the forefront. Through Nicknean, Annabelle seeks to change the way the world thinks about whiskey from Scotland and to create a whiskey which could exist in harmony with our planet and its inhabitants. Nicknean has created a spirit with exceptional body and sweetness, showcasing their smooth and elegant house style. This is achieved through a combination of sourcing high-quality organic Scottish barley, gentle fermentation and distillation processes, 
and maturation in a combination of three carefully selected cask types. X American Whiskey Casks, STR, shaved, toasted, and recharred casks that held red wine, and a small amount of Oloroso Sherry Casks. The result is flavors of lemon sherbet, juicy stone fruits, and spiced rye bread. This whiskey is set to disrupt the industry through Nick Neen's commitment to sustainability and creative approach to distilling. With an uncompromising focus, the small team of eco-conscious drinks fanatics also dedicate 10% of their spirit production to trialing different yeasts, not commonly found, in whiskey distilling, all on their journey to seek out and find new flavors in their whiskey making. If you're a longtime listener, you know how interested I am in whiskeys and distilleries like this, and how excited I am that Impex is now bringing it stateside. Annabelle will be visiting Chicago for Whiskey and Barrel Night on October 25th, and will be hosting special masterclasses featuring the key components of Nicknean, along with their core organic single malts. These tastings will also include a sneak peek of Quiet Rebels Gordon. Only 630 bottles of the special one-time-only release will be coming to the States, so it's a release and an event you won't want to miss. Nicknean Organic Single Malt is currently on its way to specialty retailers across the U.S., for more information and questions on where to buy, please contact the Impex Beverages office at office at impexbev.com and follow on social media to never miss a release. The Whiskey Ring Podcast is proudly sponsored by Impex Beverages. And jumping right into the sweet match, I think it's a great transition. Sure. Uh, there, from the outside, there seem to be two kind of sources from which the sweet mash um, decision may have come. And I, I'll present them to you and then you can tell me I'm dead wrong. But sure. uh, the first one being that you know you had Quaffon Brewery. So with a brewery, because you're not doing distillation there, there are, uh, I would call extra cleanliness measures that you need to take. Um, there's, you know, it's mostly using a, a sweet mash or otherwise having to be over as clean as you would have to be for a sweet mash distillery in terms of containers from batch to batch. So there's that starting point the other one being and we've talked about a little bit already is the visit and discussion with pat heist and shane over at wilderness trail where they're famous for the sweet mash and so i'm curious uh which both either led to the sweet mash decision and if there were any other um inputs as to why hard truth ended up going sweet mash well you you You've, you're you're checking two boxes there, David, and I'll tell you that you're very perceptive. No one's no one has drawn the line from the brewery to the distillery in that way, but you're a hundred percent correct. And I will tell you that when we first, you know, started with the open top fermenters here at the distillery, you know, it just about blew our brewers' minds. They came in and they were like, "What are you doing? How you know?" Because you know, if, if anyone has been worked in a brewery or really understands how the brewing process works versus distilling you know once you once you cool down that wort which which is like mash essentially the equivalent to mash once you're in the process of cooling that down from that moment until it goes into the bottle or the can it must be absolutely completely high you know uh hyper you know you have to have hyper attention to cleanliness and everything has to be pacified everything has to be completely clean there must not you know there can't be anything because it's still technically alive it's it's it doesn't get reboiled so um you're right uh, the the attention to cleanliness and hygiene in your brewery um was something that those those the ability to to be able to do that because if you can do it in a brewery you can certainly do it in a sweet mash distillery i i that's my opinion um so but then the second part as far as our connection with wilderness trail you know my partners you know tim and jim and, and jeff and ed uh had this vision of what this place that i'm sitting in today here on our 325 acres they had the vision for what this place was going to be from the experience standpoint from the visual standpoint from the physical the buildings and the layout and the experience yeah the guest experience i should say um and really what i was given the challenge to help develop was what is what is our whiskey system going to to be how you know what kind of column or what kind of distillation system how should we run it what should we make um 
And so I was fortunate to be, uh, have the opportunity to, to work through that with our team on, on what that should be. And I didn't do it in a vacuum. Everybody is a part of that, but, um, as I, I obviously, because we're so close to Kentucky, I spent a lot of time with Cole, our, who we worked together at the beginning, Cole Smith, and I spent a lot of time taking field trips down to Kentucky. Um, and thank God this industry is the way it is because, you know, all I had to do was lob a call to the front desk of any of the places and say, hey, we're, you know, a distillery in Indiana. We're looking at our next phase of operations, wanted to see if we could get a you know, either a regular tour or if, if we couldn't, you know, time with one of your distillers or someone in operations. And there was not a single place that turned us down. You know, they all said, oh, yeah, hell yeah, I'll let, you, let, you know, we'll let so-and-so know. And we'll either you'll go on a tour, you know, like an off the you know industry tour with them or you'll take our regular tour. And then once you're done, you can have time with, you know, X, Y, and Z person. So spend a lot of time down in Kentucky. And this would have been in 2016. And so at that time, Wilderness Trail really wasn't on many people's radars. Uh, They did not have any whiskey in the market yet. Um, They did have their, you know, firm solutions, which people in the industry knew them for their yeast business. Um, But as we were researching places we needed to visit down in Kentucky, I saw it down there, but they weren't on the Kentucky Bourbon Trail yet. And, And I didn't really know much about it. But we were, so really one day it was just like, hey, we're going to be kind of in the Lexington area. Let's pop down Danville and just go check this place out. So we called and uh, Emily Toadvine, who's still there, said, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll get Dr. Pat and Shane to meet with you. And so me and Cole went down there and uh, Dr. Pat and Shane met us. And I mean, they had no need to do this although they did eventually sell us yeast which is maybe maybe part of the motivation but um they spent like three hours with us you know answered every one of my multitude of questions walked us through their their plant and this is when they had their 18 inch column running um and i had never even i'll be honest with you i had never even heard of sweet mash to that point so they're talking sweet mash sweet mash this sweet mash that and really emphasized it a lot and to my ear at first it sounded kind of like a marketing thing right like a a marketing hook um but then the deeper that they got into you know the reasons of what it does with change in flavor and and this and that because i my brain works kind of in a culinary way it it had my mind creating these flavors on my palate you know in my imagination i was like god that sounds really interesting i'm curious what that translates to so at the end of our time with them, we walked over to their, that time they had one little teeny tiny Rick house. If anyone's been there before, it's still there. It's this little bitty building. Um, it looks like a shed compared to the other ones. Um, they walked us in there and their oldest whiskey at that time, I think was two years old, just under two maybe. And it was a rye whiskey and they drilled the barrel. And when I tasted that whiskey, it absolutely altered um my thinking moving forward because i love complexity and balance that's where i'm all my brain and whether i'm making uh, food or creating spirit or making beer you know i i don't want things to be out of balance but i love that real depth of complexity and in their just under two-year-old whiskey i had never tasted a rye whiskey especially that was that it wasn't green grassy if there were really weren't any off flavors, it was just complex and soft. I mean, it wasn't ready yet, but it was unbelievable, right? And so they explained to me that, you know, the reason is, is that the, the distillate is so good going into the barrel that there's very little subtraction that you're having to rely on from the barrel. It's more about how does the barrel contribute to the distillate? um over time and finding that point at which they you know they meet so um the second part of your question yes meeting shane and pat was as far as you know making the decision to go sweet mash they they absolutely were the ones that lit that fire in us and then you know then it was a matter of okay so if we're going to do this you know we don't we want to we want to make it our own and bring it to brown county and uh, so, but th- those guys maintained um, a great connection with us. They they uh, assisted us in developing our procedures and the layout of our system. 
Um, they were hands on. They were they were here at our distillery the first day we ran our still. Shane and Pat were here, and I'll never forget that. I I, I owe a lot to them. They're uh, they're they're wonderful guys, and they were a, a, a huge huge mentor um, to me and to what we've got here at Hard Truth. So then I will. I have a couple of questions on you know the sweet mashing that I will. Mm-hmm save because i will definitely be making that um you know head to head with alan happen so i'm going to save those questions for for that see what alan's going to do though is alan's going to be able to um to go into his historical and biochemical perspective and when he does that then i'm going to have to like take a left turn and just start talking about something else so it should be it should be pretty lively and fun i think (laughs) always always is but so uh let's the sweet mashing is at the, you know, beginning of the process, if you will, closer to the beginning. But even before that, you've mentioned a couple of times you have multiple mash bills. You're mm-hmm. not just working with one, let's say one rye mash bill to right. come out. So um, the one that uh, I've gotten to try was the high road rye, uh, which is right. one of the newer expressions. Mm-hmm. Uh, so is that 55% rye, 36% corn, 9% malted barley. Um, right. which in it in itself was as far as I could find, I, I looked pretty extensively. It That's not one that's used by anyone else that has made their mash bill public. Correct. So, um, so let's start with that one. How did you come up with that mash bill? Sure. So we, our original, uh, so our, our, if you look on our bottles for sweet mash bottles, the bottom, those, some of the older ones will say mash bill one. Um, but really now we've, we've, we've put the code on there. If it says RW one, that's rye whiskey one mash bill one. If it says RW two, RW three, RW four, five, six, those are the mash bill. That's our internal mash bill code. Um, so the RW two mash bill, which is our high road, um, we wanted our RW one mash bill is ninety four percent rye, six percent malted barley, so pretty close, obviously, to the ninety five five. Um, I, I do love that flavor profile. That you know, if you do, you know, close to one hundred percent rye correctly, I, I just it's just this wonderful explosion of flavor on your palate with some depth of sweetness and, and amazing. Um, I, I love that whiskey. Uh, that being said, I also like. And I'm not going to call high road this, but it's I, I use the term Kentucky style rye whiskey because a lot of the Kentucky distilleries that make rye whiskey incorporate a lot more corn because it really brings it more into the bourbon, um, the bourbon universe of flavors with that um, with you know 36 percent corn. So <clears throat> what I wanted was I wanted I wanted to have a rye whiskey mash bill in our arsenal that did utilize you know some corn um in the best way so as far as you know 36 versus 35 versus 37 um <clears throat> you know a lot of those when someone's coming up with the mash bill um you know i i i can envision you know if i if i taste through several mash bills of whiskeys from different people um you know and i and i watch that corn increase for example in a rye mash bill you know i have in my brain i have locked in you know, what are those contributions um, in, in the overall flavor profile? And then in my in my mind, I can kind of push and pull that flavor profile. So so the where we ended up with it, um, I'm really, really happy with that whiskey because I, I, I believe it's just a really utility uh, rye whiskey that appeals to rye whiskey lovers. It appeals to bourbon lovers. Um, it's it's fantastic in cocktails. It's great as a meat pour. And then we wanted to have a whiskey because I, first of all, I gotta, I gotta admit, I love cask strength whiskey. I, bottled and bond is about as low as I like to go personally whenever I'm drinking whiskey, but that's just because I, I love that real deep, rich complexity on my tongue. Um, we knew we wanted to have a whiskey that was lower than a hundred proof. And as we were um, letting all our mash bills, uh, you know, um, age, we were doing experimentation. Me and Chris Moore, who, who's kind of my right hand man in the in the barreling blending department and evaluation department, you know, we did some experimentations where we took all of our mash bills, you know, from their cast strength down to ninety, 
And with the high road rye, we found this amazing, we did it in, in, in increments of two proof points. So we did 90, 92, 94, 96. And what Chris and I found was, and we did a double blind, is that he loved 92 and I loved 94. And totally blind, like out of, from 90 to cask, those were our favorite proof points. And we even blinded, we didn't know what proof points we were tasting. Um, but we both noted this incredible maple note that came out and this, you know, a nice mouthfeel and richness. And then after a double blind, when we both realized that we were in that low 90s range, first of all, it was shocking to us because we actually felt like the mouthfeel got better at that range. Um, but uh, then we said, well, Chris, let's, let's, I said, let's split the hairs and get to 93 and see if we like that one. And then we both agreed that 93 was even better than what we liked 92 or 94. So that, that, that proof point on the high road was very, very purposeful. We knew we wanted a whiskey at a lower proof and out of all of our, you know, five rye mash bills and five bourbon mash bills that we had some experimentation on from the first couple of years, we really honed in on uh, that, that particular high road mash bill as the one we wanted to highlight at 93 proof. So it's great cocktails. It's great neat. It's great with a cube. Um, and at a, you know, at a, a shelf price at just under $40 for a true grain to glass craft rye whiskey, um, we knew we had the opportunity to really have a great, a great bottle of whiskey that you could, you know, see behind a bar you know, on a cocktail menu or um, at, a, at your favorite bar or restaurant um, or at your home bar or really anywhere. Just a nice utility player whiskey. Absolutely. And like you said, at that at that price point, it's something you can play around with. It's something that even if you end up not liking it, it's not going to burn a hole in your wallet for for right. trying it out, which is ideal for, especially if you're trying a new brand, which which you are. Right. Um, so th that being said, let's go to kind of the next uh, stage of that, which is with all those mash bills comes obviously many different products at that that can be sure. on the shelf. Yep. So if someone, let's say it's consumer is looking at the shelf and they see a bunch of products from Hard Truth, uh, how would you kind of direct them based on what they might like to and how does that relate to your mash bills? Sure. So, you know, we, we, you really don't know what kind of whiskey you're make, you know, you're going to make or what the flavor profile is going to be until you make it. So in that first year I did a handful, I, I say five bourbon and five rye. Um, but out of those, we really made, you know, a production quantity of, of three of each. Um, and so really two ryes and three bourbons. Um, so the other ones we just made, you know, 30, 40 barrels, just to kind of get a gauge of where they were going to go and then potentially add them into the fold as we move forward. Um, so right now, our sweet mash rye that's on the shelf in the real dark green um, label, there are some single barrels out there. Uh, they're typically, if they're not single barrels, they're a batch of 30 barrels. So I think we're on batch nine or 10 right now out in all of our states. That's the 94.6 rye whiskey. It's a cask strength. It is a just a big, beautiful, rich, bold, lush expression of rye whiskey. Um, I found that that even people who say, oh, I'm not a rye guy, if they're big bourbon fans and they like older whiskeys, even though this isn't older whiskey, but the, it drinks like a complex older whiskey, um, they send, tend to love that whiskey. But again, if you think about it, it's a 94% rye, 6% malt and barley at cask strength. Right. So it's 116, 170 proof. That's going to be a, a big whiskey. Right. So and it's intended to be that way. So that one's on the shelf. We've got good distribution of that high road rye again with that corn. We've talked about that. It's it can be a little bit more of a, a playful one. It's 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 a little bit of an easier whiskey for folks that aren't maybe used to is that big, bold rye um, in your face rye. Um, and then we've got, so then what I did with those other mash bills that I talked about is we have some limited releases. So, um, our master distillers reserve that comes out in the, in the, in the winter every year, which is our chocolate malted rye, uh, malted rye and caramel malt for the last two years. Those are some mash bills. Those are mash bills three, four, and six. 
Um, those are mash bills that that uh, we don't have a lot of whiskey of, so they're more, you know, we only dump like nine or 10 barrels of each, put it out in the market at cast strength, and they kind of get sprinkled out and people can find them. You know, we're not trying to create some sort of false uh, scarcity. We really don't have much of that whiskey. Um, and they're delicious. So we did we did go into a little bit higher production on a couple of those. But uh, And then, then we're also doing some barrel-finished stuff. So uh, we just released the barrel-finished reserve series uh, where we took that Mashville 1, that 94.6 rye, and finished it in two French barrels, so a cognac and a um, Sauternes barrel. And then we finished in a PX Brandy and PX Sherry, so a couple Spanish barrels. Uh, those are out in the market in very limited quantities. Those are delicious as well. Um, but the thing I've not mentioned yet, David, because they're not on the market yet, is our bourbon. So um, mm. I will tell you, the press release hasn't hit yet, but I have been teasing it. 2024 will be the year that you will see hard truth sweet mash bourbon out in the market. And um, you will see more than one expression, I'll tell you that. And I'll tell you this too, they are delicious. I'm really, really very, I'm very excited to, I mean, they're really everything you just listed. I want to try. I mean, I'm, I'm going to go uh, check out if some of the stores near me have, or ones that I can access, have some of the other uh, rise. I know plenty of people in the indie area uh, to mm-hmm. try to find some of the you know closer to home expressions, if you will. Uh, but well, and, and also for you and, and for your listeners, if you go, I know this sounds like a plug, but seriously, if you go to hardtruth.com, we've got one of those, spirit finder widgets on there you know and you plug in your zip code and then there's drop down menu and you can actually filter which specific expression you want and it will tell you where it's located near you so perfect and and i I definitely will and i'm i'll look forward to the bourbon too next year oh yeah Uh, Yeah. actually i guess i think when this episode goes live it'll be this year i think we'll be in 2020 oh cool yeah so um, yeah so this year you know let me uh jump i'm going to jump forward for a moment because this is relevant to the to the product line so um back in april of 2021 you were on uh the bourbon show with uh, steve akeley and the crew friends of mine mm-hmm. uh, and at that time you were in six states looking to add 10 more by the beginning of 2022 mm-hmm. and then uh you had plans to be in all 50 states by the end of that year by the end of 2022 right um, this was something that you yourself called aggressive, and I would agree with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that's an aggressive goal. And as we're mm-hmm. in the end of 2023, beginning of 2024, I got to ask, were you successful in hitting that goal? Well, you know, goals, we have goals and then we have um, BHAGs uh, goals, which I'm not sure if your folks are familiar with that, but big hairy ass goals so we we've always had our site set on um you know full national distribution which is still we've not deviated from that um but as anyone who's in the industry in any capacity whether you're in the distributor world or the retailer world or the producer world um being successful to move into a lot of states um quickly is very expensive so um what we what we've chosen to do is is we've we've learned that you know the states that we have taken on recently which has been new york and texas um those two are gigantic markets and obviously the uh the illinois market is big with chicago and the florida market is big so um what we've done is we've we've put our plan together to be able to really get you know, deep, deep success in the markets that we're currently in and add new markets, you know, as, as, as opportunity presents itself. Um, so I could be saying this and, uh, you know, say, well, you know, we're going to, we, you know, there'll be a few more States added to distribution in 2024. And then by the end of 2024, we could be in all 50, you know, the, the, the way that this industry works is, is kind of funny because there's, you know, there, there are moments when things move slow and then there are moments when things move very, very fast. So uh, right now we do have a, a plan to add a couple states um, this year based on some opportunities that are in front of us. Um, but obviously, you know, some of the big West Coast states, California, Washington, um, those are some really great markets. 
and they require a lot of um, a, a lot of expense and, and time to get right. So we're just we're measuring it all out um, in real time. So I wouldn't say that we didn't uh, we didn't meet our goal, but we're not we're not there as fast as I thought. It would be. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, like you said, you you said it was a very aggressive goal, and I mean, oh yeah, there. I don't I don't know off the top of my head if there are any places that could really hit that. In, right. in and right. but to what you said, the the point is also you know you want to be places where, of course, where you can afford it, but also where places where you can send people to to introduce your spirit. Mm-hmm. As we know, if it if it just pops up on a shelf, it's it's kind of a hard sell. But if someone's there, tasting you on it, telling you what this is, promoting it, then um, you know doing that in two states can be more cost effective or more cost uh, more profit driving. Than being right. in ten states where you've got nobody. So well, so think about this too. Whenever I I, I remember that because that's I mean that was a, that was definitely our plan. Think about from that moment till now. The the category expansion is still just exploding. I mean, I, I still I I feel like I know all the brands that are popping up, but then I go to my local liquor store in Bloomington, Indiana, Big Red. And I'm like, good God, where did those 30 new brands come from, right? So what has also been changing exponentially is the noise on the shelf. So the more noise there is on the shelf, the more difficult it is, difficulty it is to, to be, you know, a differentiator in new emerging markets. Um, and so the more difficult it becomes, of course, the more expensive it becomes, right? Because to your point, you know, now the consumer, you know, they did have, 30 of their favorite bourbons. Now they've got 50 on top of those 30 that are on their list of, Oh, I got to buy that bottle next. And then by the time they start on that list, there's another 30 on top of that. Right. So how do you, how do you jump, how do you jump the line and get, get in front of consumers to try you above other folks? Um, and that's, I think what a lot of the new brands and producers are, are, are kind of figuring out right now. Definitely. So just in, in the last, uh, you know, 15 or so minutes we've got, I, I have so many questions still left, but I'll try to either truncate them or, or run through them. But um, sure. with, with the product line, uh, the other product that I got to try uh, in preparation for this episode was uh, your rye with the uh, Melon Camp collaboration. Yes. And I'd love to know your harvest rye. The harvest rye. And, and you, you mentioned it earlier, but I wanted to come yep. back to it. Uh, you mentioned the harvest rye earlier, but I want to come back to it in the context of the Melon Camp collaboration. And how did that, you know, how did that come about, and and what does it mean for Hard Truth? Sure. So you know, it's uh, I'll I'll try to make sure and keep this somewhat succinct, though it's <laughs> a it's a really fun story that kind of weaves bobs and weaves. But let's start with the the the, the laying down of the whiskey. So. Well, let's let me, let me go farther than that. Let's start with our farmer relationships. So, you know, our relationship with our farmer partners, which we've had the same farmer partners from before we turned one shovel of dirt on this property. Um, Doug Miller grows our corn and some of our wheat, and Dwayne Kulenschmidt grows Dr. Kulenschmidt grows some of our rye. Not all of it, but some of it. Um, and then we have farmer partners on the back end that that take our slop and have built a business feeding cattle with that. Um, These relationships that we have with these farmers involve um, uh, it's far deeper than like, Hey, there's five people lined up behind you that if it doesn't work out, I'm going to go with them. I mean, these are significant relationships. You know, these are almost familial relationships because it's very important what they're doing for you, but also you want a continuity there. Um, and good news is, is farmers and whiskey makers tend to be pretty good friends with one another. So, um, this really started with our, our relationship with our farmers. And as I was working through that, our second year of production, um, and Dwayne called me with that load of rye, I said, you know what, this is an opportunity for me to really highlight a whiskey that uses only grains grown by our farmers. So, um, that the harvest rye that's out in the melon camp package is 72% rye grown by Dr. Kulenschmidt and 
corn grown by Doug Miller, our farmer here in Brown County and Rush County. So I laid down that whiskey and, you know, only, I can't remember exactly, maybe a hundred or so barrels of it, um, of, bur- of rye and then some of bourbon. And I said, you know, somewhere down the road, I want to do a uh, release of whiskey to celebrate our farmer relationships. And maybe we can give back to farmers in some way, family farmers. So that was the seed of the idea. Um, then uh, we we have had a, a chief marketing officer, John Bailing, joined us um, a little over a year ago. And as he and I were getting to know one another and I was talking to him about our farmer stories, he said, you know, from a marketing standpoint, he said, well, you guys, you know, what your connection with your farmers and what you're doing with your farmers is just in general in your operations is so noteworthy and consumers should know that, like, don't hide that from them. Um, and so really, John and the team <clears throat> developed um, a, a program called Grounded in Truth. And the idea was to, um, you know, provide some some way of funding um, family farming and, you know, clean ground initiatives uh, to celebrate our farmers. So those two things started converging. I said, well, hey, John, I've got this whiskey that I did, I think we could utilize for this. So we already had this grounded in truth thing happening. Okay. And then um, HUD Mellencamp and Levi Collison reached out to me um, February of last year. And, you know, we've been reached, we've been contacted a number of times, people wanting to do private label stuff. And our, the way we've organized our business is we're really not set up for that. So, but I always, I typically, you know, if I've got the time, I'll meet with folks and hear them out, show them around. So they said that they were, they were working on a, you know, they had started Mellon Camp Whiskey Company and it was in its infancy and they really were hyper-focused on working with someone very regional to them And they didn't have any big lofty ideas of, you know, this big giant brand that they just wanted to highlight farmers and Indiana and good whiskey making. And so I said, huh, that's interesting. Right. So kind of met with those guys and got to know them. Great, great gentlemen. Um, Great vision. I love the fact that they weren't, you know, they didn't they weren't trying to come up with a big splashy celebrity brand that was going to be everywhere all at once. Um, And so we started to work on what we could do as a collaboration. Um, Obviously, HUD's father um, had, you know, was one of the founders of Farm Aid. Um, And so we were trying to figure out how we could kind of put this together. So through their, you know, hard work and and collaboration and everyone on our team, um, we did this collaboration, which essentially launched Mellencamp Whiskey Company. um, And it also got our Grounded in Truth campaign closer to Farm Aid. So for end of 23 and 2024, Hard Truth is an actual, we are a uh, corporate sponsor of Farm Aid. We were at the Farm Aid concert this past uh, fall, um, pouring our harvest rye. So the nuts and bolts of the actual whiskey um, are, we're going to have four unique whiskeys. One was released sept- or, you know, uh, fall of 2023. We're going to release another one, spring of 24, fall 24, and spring of 25. So it's going to be a collector series of four whiskeys. Each one features will feature a unique and different uh, painting by John Mellencamp himself. Um, and then each whiskey will be a completely unique expression. So we're really going to have some fun with it, do some barrel finishes. There's going to be some bourbon thrown in there. Um, it, these these four whiskeys are going to be awesome, but for a collector standpoint, you know those are going to be four whiskeys that that you'll be able to put on a shelf and and tell the story. But the the great news is also a pro, portion of proceeds from each bottle of profits um, are going directly to our grounded in truth, which is going directly to Farm Aid. So I try to keep it short, but it's a long story, man. No, no, that's fantastic, and uh, it it's I love it because it's for a good cause. It's um if you'll if you'll permit me saying it's it it doesn't for me it doesn't feel like it even comes close to like the celebrity whiskey market this is right. very much about the co- the cause and the uh yeah that's what it is it's about the cause and about showcasing it a is. different type of whiskey uh, and there's nothing right. necessarily wrong with celebrity whiskeys but we both know they can you know they're, it's a mixed bag at best well um, and and the reality is is really john 
you know, other, other than, you know, uh, John's founding of Farm Aid and his work there and, and the, the like mindedness and then having, you know, him him offering up some of his art for us to use this really, you know, Mellencamp Whiskey Company is Hud Mellencamp and Levi Collison. And they're going to put their stamp on the industry in their own way. Um, you know, obviously having the connection to Farm Aid helps you know, us all out because it's a, it show it highlights kind of what we're doing, but yeah, to your point, it's not really a celebrity whiskey. John doesn't even drink. So it's, it's uh you know, this is really more about what we're doing to celebrate our farmers. And on top of all of it, the whiskey itself is a unique mash bill that we only, you know, it's only offered through that expression and it is delicious. I mean, I, I don't know if you got a chance to try it, but it's got the, yeah. for me, it's a lot of really intense butterscotch. It's just, it's really good. And also I just got my, uh, my issue of whiskey advocate, the year end issue, and, uh, they did review it in there and it got a 92, um, in the latest issue of whiskey advocate. So we've not put, we've not, you know, did a press, done a press release or talked about that quite yet because it just hit the stands the other day, but, uh, but pretty sure. cool. I'm glad that that whiskey's getting some good recognition. Yeah. I mean, I, I did get to taste it. I taste that and the high road, um, both I thought were really great rise. Um, I'll admit, Thank Just you. for my own palate, I did like the high road a little bit better, right. but you know, palate, you know, palates from one to one or the other. And like I said, the melon camp was uh, the harvest rye was still an excellent rye. Uh, okay, so you know, you. I've got the first one now, and look forward to to collecting the other ones. Right. Uh, so, like I said, I, I have so many more questions. There's um, easily another half hour, forty five. I could I could ask about. Um, Sure. So, but I just want to run through a couple of things that we we won't get to, but that I want people to take a look at. And there'll also be sure. a list of these in the show notes, which are um, number one, Midwest Distillers Fest. Yes. Uh, would, I would love to visit that. Um, not next year, I, I don't think, but maybe if it's held the year after, I can do that. But it it's the idea of these localized whiskey fests where you're not getting the same brands you get at every other whiskey festival. It's something very topical and close to the heart of the Midwest. So that was something um, that you and Hard Truth had a, a hand at starting back in 2018. We so did. I'd love to get to that. Um, I also really wanted to ask you, I'll be honest about your um, your obsession with Mezcal. Mm, and, yeah. uh, you know, and the smokiness and, um, oh, I'll ask Chrisley, did you ever happen to get in touch with James at uh, Schlieve League Distillery in Donegal, Ireland? I have not. No. Oh, yes. Wait a minute. Yeah, I do believe James reached out to me one time. I think so. Yeah. All right. I was going to say, if not, he's been on the podcast before. So, and okay. talking about the, you know, the Midnight Silkies, I'd love to uh, reconnect if if you want. Um, yeah. yeah. And then uh, one of the things was you said earlier, and I meant to pick up on this, that um, you have an interesting culinary palate. And there was... Mm -hmm. I forget which interview it was in, but uh, you mentioned that your family, in your family, uh, you have some Asian roots and yes. that you grew up eating uh, what we would consider more Asian foods. And obviously that comes with a whole different, a whole different portfolio of flavor notes that you can get. Oh, yeah. And um, maybe we can explore that a little more with when we talk about the, the sweet mash and the flavor profiles, but I would love to know if there were flavors that you use in notes when you're tasting that others wouldn't get well they didn't have the background sure so my aunt my aunt was born in japan and um came over to this country in the um late 60s i believe um so before i was born and so i was fortunate to grow up with some traditional japanese cooking the thing that i that i took mostly from her and still do she's she's still i still can't wait to go down and eat her cooking um, but specifically with Japanese cuisine is, is I love the, and it's kind of similar to some traditional Italian cooking where you, you utilize the absolute, you know, spare no expense on the ingredients and then prepare them very simply. You know, you don't need to overdress or overwork things. Um, so I think that that, that philosophy I try to carry through, whether I'm cooking something or making a whiskey or making a beer is if I find myself getting overly fussy with something, I, I step back and I try to just stay to the bare 
essence of the elements and let them shine. So I, I would say in a short short snippet, that's that's the thing that I've taken the most from my influence from my aunt for sure. Makes sense. And, uh, yeah. and you know, the last thing that again, we unfor- unfortunately, and listeners, this is on, this is my fault. I should say that I'm cutting short. I almost never do this on interviews, but I, this is on me, but I wanted to talk about uh, just the experience alone of going to hard truth because you've got mm-hmm. what's been described as a Disneyland of distilled spirits. Right. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to see if I can uh, make a visit out there because like i said i've got some friends in indy and i want to visit um a few distilleries out there uh, and come down and maybe do an on-site to talk about the experience and some of the i mean you've got the the basic tours you've got um an atv get lost tour where you're going into the 325 acre property and really exploring we um, drive so, you drink exactly so I'll, I'll i'll save a little more for um hopefully when i can get out there but I wanted to ask specifically here, which is, are you still doing the Moonshiner experience? We are. So the 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 location of the Moonshine, the, moon, the location of the Moonshiners experience has moved. And we have really, I say we, our our team here on the property, led by Chris Curtin, has uh and and our my partners they have totally uh, blown that thing out of the water. We've got this Shiner's cabin now out there with a wood stove in it. It is just awesome. I mean, it is super, super fun. It's a whole day thing with some, you know, campfire stew in the middle of it. You get to actually produce whiskey um, and learn a lot about the history of making whiskey in, in more rudimentary fashion. And uh, you're out in our back 40 in a cabin. It's, it's, it's killer. I, yeah, I can't wait for you to get here on the property. And for anyone who wants to come, we've got a, you know, we, we really are a place where we're family friendly. People bring their kids. They come with buddies. They come with couples. They come on date nights. We have a lot of bachelorette parties. Um, we, we kind of have an experience for anyone and everyone on this property. Um, and most people find that when they come here, they're, you know, they, 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 they pick out their visit to Brown County and they say, oh, let's go to Hard Truth for dinner, you know, and then next thing you know, they, they're they like, oh my gosh, we're going to have to come back tomorrow. And they end up coming here two or three times during their visit. So um, we know how to have a good time here on the property. There's, you know, a few different bars and places where you can do tastings and get cool cocktails and uh, a lot of acreage to explore. And we have live music. It's, it's just a really, really awesome place. Definitely unlike any other place I've ever been. Oh, can't wait to visit. So, uh, Brian, with that, I'm, we're unfortunately going to have to close out this one, but I will definitely try to make it out there and uh, we'll be talking more uh, with Alan and with other guests as well. So thank you so much for coming on, talking about hard truth, uh, talking about Indiana rye in a different way in Indiana whiskey. Uh, hang out with me for just a sec after I close the recording. And this has been another episode of the Whiskering Podcast. Thanks so much for listening. Like and subscribe wherever you listen. And I'll see you all next week. It was fun, David. Thank you. Hey, folks. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Whisker Ring Podcast. If you like what you hear, please go ahead and click that subscribe, follow, or like button. Leave a rating review on your podcast app of choice. And let me know what you want to hear. You can reach out to me through the podcast apps or email me at david at whiskeymywedderring.com with any suggestions or ideas for new show guests. You can also support the podcast at patreon.com slash whiskey in my wedding ring. That's whiskey with an E for as little as a dollar a month. $5 a month gets you access to bonus content, including our soon to resume under the influencer series. And $25 a month means you join the barrel share club. Each month barrel share club members get to try products sent to me for review bottles from my own collection. And sometimes bottles that I just pick up because they're fun or interesting right now. Only five spots remain in the barrel share club. So grab your place today. Finally, please follow on Instagram. You can follow me at Whiskey My Wedding Ring or at Whiskey Ring Podcast. You can follow me on Twitter at Whiskey Ring. You can follow on Facebook at Whiskey My Wedding Ring or join the Facebook group, the Whiskey Ringers group. And I hope to see you there. Cheers. Thank you for the support and see you next time.